In Berserk, few characters command as formidable a presence as Emperor Ganeshka. His portrayal in the story is categorized by an unparalleled darkness and male violence, positioning him as the pinnacle of wickedness and the embodiment of the darkest and most depraved aspects conceivable within the story. Ganeshka's character is written to showcase his sheer indifference towards both humanity, apostles, and the overlords known as the God Hand. It's written to show a chilling disregard for any form of life or allegiance to any kind. Kinda like me when I was in my edgy emo phase, but that's besides the point. His overarching ambition is singular and absolute. The attainment of total dominion over the entire world, with no second guesses about employing any means necessary to achieve his goals. And when I say any means, fans of the series know that that is not an understatement. The intricacy in Ganishka's existence lies in the fact that the idea of evil itself birthed and groomed him, intending for him to be an unbeatable force of darkness, a menacing physical god towering over the world. It shaped him to become the ultimate enemy of Griffith in his reborn state. Ganishka's defeat results in Griffith attaining a godlike status amongst the sheep. This unexpected turn of events makes Griffith out to be the lord and savior of the world, when in reality he is the harbinger of doom and the hawk of darkness. Ganishka's story arc holds significant weight within the storyline as it explores the relentless quest for power and the consequences that arise when an apostle goes against the god hand. Also, it showcases the fact that this rebellion is something that can be perpetrated by other apostles too, but only time will tell when such an event might happen. In the Berserk storyline, Ganishka is introduced at a critical turning point of the series. Post-conviction arc and epic rebirth later, we see him exploit the chaos that has taken over Midland due to plague and famine. Powerless to resist against him, Ganishka starts his assault, seizing the royal city of Vintim as a strategic foothold for his conquest, a base of operations, so to speak. There, he, in association with Daiba, creates an army of monsters known as the Pishacha and Daka. Holding Princess Charlotte captive in the Tower of Rebirth, he wishes to solidify his control over Midland by having her bear his child. However, his scheme goes down the gutter when he realizes that Princess Charlotte knows of Griffith. Also, the reborn band of the Falcon executes a diversionary attack on Ganishka and his forces, enabling Griffith and Zod to escape with the princess. At the Holy Sea Alliance Ball in Vertanis, Ganishka, in his ethereal form, issues a declaration of war against the military alliance and launches a large-scale assault. After Guts defeats Daiba, Ganishka confronts the swordsman, expressing admiration for Guts' resilience and offering him an alliance against the band of the Falcon. Guts bluntly refuses, leading to a team-up of Guts and Zod and a confrontation where Ganishka's fog form is exposed and pierced by the Dragon Slayer. Despite this setback, Ganishka summons his army for a second wave attack against the fully encircled Holy Sea Alliance armies. The arrival of the Band of the Falcon turns the tide of the war just when it seems that the Kushan forces would prevail. In the mobile palace, Ganishka, instinctively reverent as an apostle, attempts to resist Griffith's touch by manifesting his fog form. However, Griffith uses sea winds to disperse Ganishka form, making the defeated emperor kneel and accept Griffith's ceasefire terms. Defeated, humiliated, and fueled by a burning desire for revenge, Ganishka determines that the only path to defeat Griffith is by foregoing his apostlehood and evolving into something greater. In a desperate bid for transformation, he immerses himself into the man-made behelot, emerging out as a colossal, Cthulhu-like entity. This towering figure proceeds to unleash chaos upon the world, enemies and allies alike gradually succumbing to the erosion of sanity and self-awareness. Ganishka's internal turmoil reflects the consequences of defying the God Hand, his overlords. The thought of betraying his natural masters creates a deep-seated pain that peers through his body that can only be healed by seeing a light that only an apostle like him can see, which is Griffith. Amidst the chaos, Femto arrives alongside Zod, intending to confront and defeat Ganishka. The situation intends when the Skull Knight ambushes Griffith, probably one of the coolest scenes in the whole manga, but Femto redirects the knight's attack towards Ganishka. The outcome is a monumental astral fissure, leading to the roar of the astral world. This event gives rise to the world known as Fantasia, a shift that replaces Ganishka with the emergence of the world spiral tree, marking a change in the world that led to Bonebeard coming out of One Piece to fight Isidro. Beautiful. Ganishka's early life is marked by tragedy and betrayal. In his flashback, Miura makes his empathize for the character by painting a portrait of a young prince who endured the cruelties of familial backstabbing. 
born into royalty as the eldest son of a Kashin king. His mother's favoritism towards his younger brother led to a shocking attempt on his life at a tender age. The survival of this heinous act only fueled Ganishka's desire for revenge, leading him to take the life of his own brother. Ganishka faced numerous challenges. Despite being surrounded by individuals plotting against him, he emerged resilient, earning his way into adulthood amid what he describes as a den of vipers. His ascent to power took a darker turn when, as a young man, he orchestrated the demise of his own father, seizing the throne for himself. This act, driven by fear and suspicion, laid the foundation for Ganishka's belief in ruling through dominance and conquests. The complexities of Ganishka's character deepen as he grapples with the burdens of leadership. Despite his pursuit of sovereignty, he finds peace on the battlefield, becoming a peerless warrior and commander. However, his devotion to war and conquest leaves little room for familial bonds. His fear of the idea of family coupled with the challenges he faced. His fear of the idea of family coupled with the challenges he faced adds a layer of tragic isolation to his character. Another turning point in Ganishka's life occurs when he faces yet another assassination attempt, orchestrated by his own son out of fear. Desperate to survive, Ganishka resorts to a dark and fateful choice, activating a mysterious beheret given to him by Daiba. With a sacrifice, he offers his own son to be reborn as an apostle, signaling a transformation that sets the stage for his subsequent journey in the series. His story arc reminds me a lot of Guts and how, through both their lives, they did not have one moment of peace. Both characters navigate moments of vulnerability and weakness, yet their responses differ significantly. While Guts, even in the face of overwhelming darkness against Slan and many others, resists succumbing to despair, while Ganishka is driven to activate his behelet by the pain of his own vulnerability. All in all, I feel that Ganishka is one of the most interesting characters in the Berserk series, and perhaps the most terrifying. Because if it weren't for him, then we wouldn't have witnessed such a tremendous shift in the story of Berserk. I make bonebeard jokes, but I won't lie, the art of that arc was truly majestic. Thanks for watching. Picture this. Guts is present in cushioned lands amidst the many minarets and mosques that are a staple of that land. His head is down and he is in a daze. He is surrounded on all sides by all the people who looked up to him or at the very least, respected him as a warrior. They see the image in front of them, a man depressed and lost beyond belief. No longer is he the proud warrior who took down men and apostles with a simple swing of a sword. He is defeated and seeing his defeated state, a former enemy now turned ally writes an incantation for him to recite. And after trying hard to fight his inner demons, the enemy turned ally aids Guts in recovering from his depressive state. Now recovered, the man that everyone sees in front of them is the same man, the proud warrior. But there is something different about him. He no longer has the same vengeful aura. He is now a lot more balanced and calm. He no longer thinks of revenge and the constant mental blog that is Griffith. With fits and starts, the wizard was able to help him regain his passion for the sword. The armor is still there, but Guts is now better at controlling it. Through a combo of eastern and western magic, yeah, sure, Kay is there too. He's finally able to get out of the story that Griffith is writing. If this sounds like a crackpot theory to you, then yes it is. And it's based off of a YouTube comment that I had on my previous video. Also, before going any further, let me just say that the incantation is the transliterated version from the Ash Crow soundtrack of Berserk. But even if this is a crackpot theory, it still has the potential to become reality. We all know that a depressed Guts is now setting foot on cushioned lands. These are lands that are ruled by people of a different race and religion. But if there are two threats that join Guts and his party to this foreign land, it's Rickard and Magic. If it weren't for Rickard, they would have just been wandering around with no hope. He is the beacon of light that came at just the right time in the story to save our protagonist when he needed it most. As far as magic is concerned, Guts could never have come this far if it weren't for magic. From Puck to Shirake, magic has been a focal point of Guts' journey and a major part of his healing process. And I feel that right now magic is the thing that will save Guts from his depressive state. While Shirake would be able to save him by her lonesome, I'm not selecting her for this job because right now she too is broken with the supposed destruction of Elfhelm. Moreover, her ability to control over Guts' inner darkness when donning the Berserker armor came through fits and starts. It was a learning process. I don't think she has the ability to take on such a monumental task so as to make Guts take back control of his armor. At least not now. 
the only person who is mature and experienced enough to do that is Daiba because he, on so many occasions, has come face to face with the dark arts. He knows a lot about Behelitz, the astral world, and the abyss because of his experiences with Ganishka and owing to his old age. Now because of his association with the dark arts, I feel that he's in the best of positions to help Guts overcome his darkness and become a warrior that is able to take on Griffith on an equal footing. If not this incantation, I feel that Daiba will play somewhat of a role like that in the coming chapters. Why will Daiba help is an important question in this matter. Both him and Silat are now in two minds about the Inhumans. Silat is disgusted by the thought of serving under a person who is essentially an inhuman human and I love this line of him saying this. While at the same time Daiba has learned an important lesson in dabbling with the dark arts with what eventually became of Ganishka during the Millennium Falcon arc. But what I want to hone in on is the fact that despite seeing a side that was nothing short of an abyss, Daiba is now a lot more wise. And with his whole relationship with Erika and Rickard, it just makes it too good for me to count him out as an evildoer. Also, nothing's black and white in Berserk, so that's that as well. Now, how would this make Guts be able to take on Griffith? Guts has a lot of baggage with him as far as Griffith is concerned, and the Beast of Darkness has been nothing short of a hindrance for him in gaining control over the Berserker armor. I feel that he would be in a better position if that beast was no longer there or was tamed. One aspect of taming the beast has been fulfilled. The beast had two motives. One was for Guts to give in to the hate and possibly kill Casca, and the next is to go to his death by facing Griffith. So in short, Griffith and the Beast of Darkness are two hindrances that make Guts vulnerable to overwork himself. With both of them gone, he might just be able to reach his full potential. If not outright defeat Griffith, he might just be able to take him on without losing himself. That would be the biggest blow to Griffith. Now, from the Millennium Falcon arc, we know that Griffith, post-rebirth, is a man who's akin to an author writing his own story. The popular consensus is that Rickard was able to slap Griffith because he chose to go outside the story by not following him. He crafted his own path to oppose Griffith. Now, Guts opposes Griffith as well, but his quest for revenge is what joins him into the story of Griffith. In the latter's book, he's nothing short of an ant, a shadow on the water. But here is the kicker, Guts proved that he's not that and the conviction arc is proof of that. At the very beginning of the arc, Guts was told that he was a shadow on the water by the Skull Knight. What that means to me is that Guts is nothing but a speck, a shadow in the grandeur of Griffith. But post-conviction arc, he managed to prove the Skull Knight wrong, though not necessarily in a direct manner. Rather, fate or causality, rendered Griffith's rebirth imperfect because of the same demon child that Femto corrupted. Now known as the Moonlight Boy, his presence alone is a hindrance for Griffith since it means that regardless of how big a threat Guts becomes for Falconia and Griffith, he can kill him because, well, causality made Guts Griffith's father in a way. The conviction arc proved that Guts was more than a shadow, but truly a fish leaping out of the water. This is built down upon when Griffith sends his apostle Grunbell to essentially kill Flora. While the mission is successful, it doesn't mean that Griffith won. His goal was to remove magic users and had Guts not been there, he might have gotten to kill Shirake as well. But Shirake survived, which wasn't as big of a bummer for Griffith, but it was a bummer nonetheless. Another hindrance to the author writing his own story came in the form of the Moonlight Boy and how he was able to ground Guts from his temptations. Upon rebirth, Griffith wanted his heart frozen but causality paved a different path. The amount of love that the Moonlight Boy has for his parents, regardless of current circumstances, has not vanished and this is the biggest blow to Griffith since he could destroy everyone around Guts. He really can't do that. But the Moonlight Boy would not allow him to harm Guts in any manner. What I mean to say with all of this is that Guts' story and branding is directly linked to Griffith in more ways than one. The only way Guts can move out or leap out is by struggling. True enough, he's been doing that, but this is where the second thing comes in. Skull Knight said, struggle and contend. He has to come to terms with Griffith's antics. Only through overcoming that hate can he be able to take control of his own life and in the process, defeat Griffith. A repeat of past events might be a possibility because the moment Guts leaves Griffith's story, does Griffith experience a fall of epic proportions? Now you might be wondering why I did not include Casca in all of this because she's just as much a part of Griffith's story as Guts. 
Here's the thing, now that she's recovered, Casca will have to struggle just as much and contend as well. The bond of the two cursed strugglers would be enough of a signal for causality to make its mark and signal the demise of Griffith's empire. In any case, I honestly feel that Griffith can do jack to the two. I don't want to make this video too long but I will cover Casca in the coming videos. I've already got part 1 out for her character and hopefully I'll make more, so stay tuned and subscribe till then. Also, thanks for watching. I'm kind of a broken record when it comes to Silat. He represents the East, so I'm bound to like him. Go East. No, 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 not that much. In anticipation for the upcoming Eastern arc of Berserk, I've spoken a lot about Silat, Daiba, and the Bakiraka clan. A lot of my narrative videos have been about them. Aside from their importance in the overall future of Berserk, their story is that of a slow burn, with bits and pieces of information given about them throughout the series. As fans, we are never given the full picture of who they are and their past. Silat is a prime example of such a narrative arc and characterization. Though seemingly a weak character, Silat has been with us since the very beginning considering that his actual debut was in chapter 41, a good 30 or so chapters before the Great Eclipse. There are so many questions that arise with his introduction, like why was Silat in the West in the first place? Was looking for the land of the Oracle the only reason why he was there? If the latter was the case, why a whole two years prior to Griffith's rebirth? But regardless of what might have happened, one thing is for sure is that his debut taught him a lesson. He realized where he stood in the world and got his comeuppance as a young warrior. If he was truly there to fight the strongest of men, a Musashi-esque journey of sorts. Then he certainly fought and lost against the toughest guy in the West. From a storyline perspective, Silat's introduction showed us that there was a world beyond Midland, Windham, Tudor, and the general Western empires. If his first appearance was something of importance, then the second one was certainly one that etched the character in everyone's minds. Silat saw Griffith's rebirth. He was one of the few people who witnessed it live. Though he couldn't necessarily capture Griffith as they were ordered by the cushions, Silat nonetheless was able to witness his in the making. A lot more questions arise here as well. Who was the Oracle? Who are the Tapasa and why are they so close to Silat? Well, we get the answer to that second question fairly quickly. This is where two stories coincide, the slow burn revelations of Silat's past and the messed up world that he finds himself in. To make a long video short, we see Silat being humiliated by both Kushan generals and Emperor Ganeshka for being unable to capture Griffith. He witnesses Rakshas's return and him swearing allegiance to Griffith as an apostle. There is a string of bad blood between Rakshas and Silat's group, leading to more questions in the making. Swearing allegiance to Ganeshka, he witnesses the man-made Behelet and the birth of Dhaka soldiers and the revelation that Ganeshka is not human but rather a demon. He witnesses the horrors of Ganeshka's apostle form. When we next see him, it's clear that Ganeshka's truth has somewhat affected Sila to some degree. Instead of doing his job, Sila just stares off into the distance in the middle of a war. His role now shifts towards being an observer rather than being an actor. He spies on the powerful meeting between master and slave and sees what Ganeshka is in front of his natural master. After Ganeshka's initial defeat, Sila says this, which instantly gives him a more philosophical edge as a character considering what he has been through. While the world is praising Griffith, he is still in two minds about following such a man. I'm genuinely in love with this scene, not just because of Silat's words, but also Laban's reaction to these words. This is something of interest because Laban's always been the silent skeptic of sorts but we'll come to that in another video. And then finally we see his daring escape from Falconia, him spying on Griffith and Rickard, and his fight with Rakshas. All of these things truly made him a fan favorite. Now bear in mind that all these appearances in the manga are not continuous. His first appearance is in volume 9, then 18, then 21 and 22, and then 27. Only after 30 or so volumes do we get to see his character expanded upon in a significant manner. In the current journey towards the East, we can see his backstory unfold significantly. Only time will tell the impact that this proud Bakiraka warrior will have on the story. At this point, we can only wait for what chapter 276 brings forth for us, if it ever comes out. Please leave a like for the algorithm and thanks for watching.